KOA1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from John Russell, Brian Lynn, and Dorothy Gundy. Later, Katie Weaver and Anne Ball will bring us the next part in our series on America's National Parks. But first, children are suffering severe trauma as Israel continues its bombing campaign against Hamas militants in the Gaza Strip. Gaza health officials say at least 63 children are among the 217 Palestinians who have been killed in Gaza. The fighting between Israel and Hamas began on May 10th. One example is seven-year-old Susie Ishkantana. She spent hours Sunday under the wreckage of her family home. Her brothers, sisters, and mother died. Now she speaks or eats very little. In Israel, 12 people have been killed by rockets fired by the militant group Hamas, which rules Gaza. All but one of the people killed were civilians. One was a five-year-old boy. For many children, it is trauma they have experienced for much of their lives. Israel and Hamas also fought wars in 2009, 2012, and 2014. Each time, Israel has launched heavy airstrikes in the small area where two million people live. Israel says it does everything it can to prevent civilian deaths. Sometimes, Israel sends warnings to people to leave buildings that are about to be bombed. Hamas has fired hundreds of rockets, but most are stopped by Israel's defense system. Israel also continues to bomb targets in Gaza. The Ishkantana family was buried under their home early Sunday after intense bombing of Gaza City. Israel said it was targeting a Hamas tunnel network. The strikes came without warning. Riyad Ishkantana said he was buried for five hours under a big piece of wreckage. He was unable to reach his wife and five children. I was listening to their voices beneath the rubble. I heard Dana and Zane calling, Dad, Dad, before their voices faded, and then I realized they had died, he said, speaking about two of his children. Susie was brought to the hospital alive, the second oldest of his three daughters and two sons. She was the only survivor. The young girl was in severe trauma and shock, said Dr. Zuair al -Jaro. He said the hospital could not get her the psychological treatment she needs because of the continued fighting. She has entered into a deep depression, al -Jaro said. The Ishkantanas were just one family destroyed that day. The Israeli military said, the strikes Sunday targeted Hamas tunnels under Gaza City. The strikes hit Alwada Street. Reports say it is one of the city's busiest streets and has many buildings where people live and includes stores and restaurants. Three buildings were destroyed and many people from at least three families were killed. In all, 42 people died, including 10 children and 16 women. Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Konrikus is an Israeli military spokesman. He said 
The airstrikes caused a tunnel to collapse, bringing houses down with it. He said civilian deaths were not the aim. The Norwegian Refugee Council is a group that aims to help displaced people. It said 11 of the children killed in this war were involved in its program. One of the children was 8-year-old Dana, Susie's sister. Josefa Yashi is with the Norwegian Refugee Council. The violence will, of course, affect the psychology of these kids, he said. We are expecting that the situation will be much worse and more children will need more support. The Refugee Council says it works with 118 schools in Gaza, affecting more than 75,000 students. Its Better Learning program trains teachers to help traumatized children and organizes fun exercises to ease stress. Jan Eigeland is the council's secretary general. He called for a ceasefire, saying, Spare these children and their families. Stop bombing them now. But in the longer term, he called for an end to the blockade on Gaza and the occupation of Palestinian territory. It is necessary if we are to avoid more trauma and death among children, he said. Experts say it could be 2023 or later before COVID-19 vaccines are widely available in some countries. The United States, Israel, and Britain are among the countries where more than half of the population has gotten at least one injection or shot. But... Some countries have fewer than 1% of their populations vaccinated. They include South Africa, Pakistan, and Venezuela. About 10 countries, mostly in Africa, reportedly have no vaccines at all. There are many reasons for the difference. Economic ones play an important part. But, some people say... So do intellectual property laws that cover scientific discoveries. These laws protect people's creative or scientific work from being reproduced without their permission. The administration of U.S. President Joe Biden has supported waiving intellectual property protections for the vaccines. But it is not clear if there will be an agreement on the issue. It is also unclear if such an agreement would speed production. COVAX, a United Nations-supported project, aims to ensure that poor countries around the world are able to get vaccines. But COVAX has run behind schedule. The reason for the delay is partly because India, a vaccine manufacturer, has banned vaccine exports as it faces increased coronavirus infections. Some countries are also stockpiling vaccines. Stockpiling means getting and keeping a large supply of something for future use. In April... Researchers at Duke University said that, even with help from COVAX, many countries would not be able to reach a 60% vaccination level until 2023 or later. Matthew Cavanaugh is a global health policy expert at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., Kavanaugh suggested that pre-ordering partly explains why rich countries have more vaccines. The U.S., European, and other wealthy nations long ago pre-ordered nearly all the doses available 
and now other countries, even with the money to buy, are at the back of line waiting, Kavanaugh said. China and Russia are among the countries that have committed to giving vaccines to other nations. Others, including the United States and Britain, have not yet opened their stockpiles, although they have committed to doing so. However, some experts expect low vaccine supplies to continue for years to come. There is simply not enough vaccine to go around, Kavanaugh said. I'm John Russell. Apple is fighting a court battle against Epic Games that could affect how major technology companies are regulated in the future. The trial, which began in California on May 3rd, is expected to last about a month. It centers on whether Apple's control over its App Store system unlawfully locks out competition. Apple requires that nearly all third-party software developed for iPhones and other iOS devices be released through its App Store. It also requires developers to use Apple's in-app payment system, which charges commissions of up to 30%. Epic, which sells its hugely popular Fortnite video game on the App Store, argues that Apple's requirements establish a monopoly. The two companies are debating whether Apple has the right to set its own rules, fully control its payment system, and remove apps from the App Store. Epic tried to avoid paying Apple by creating its own payment system for Fortnite. But Apple said the action violated its rules, and the company kicked Epic out of the App Store. That dispute led Epic to bring the legal action against Apple. Apple rejects Epic's arguments. It says its payment structure is not unusual in the industry, and it says its commissions are fair in exchange for giving developers access to a worldwide marketplace that it spent $100 billion to build. Epic's CEO, Tim Sweeney, admitted in court that his company knowingly violated Apple's rules by creating its own payment system for Fortnite. Sweeney said Epic took the action in an effort to prove a point. I wanted the world to see that Apple exercises total control over all software on iOS, and it can use that control to deny users access to apps, he testified. Epic says Apple's system makes it as hard as possible for users to stop buying Apple products and services. Apple argues that Epic's rules violation was an attempt by the company to increase its own profits by benefiting from Apple's massive App Store structure. Sweeney said in court that Epic is seeking to increase profits through its own App Store, which charges 12% commissions on in-app sales. While that model is not currently profitable, Sweeney said it could be in the future. Even though Apple's late co-founder Steve Jobs publicly said the App Store was not expected to make a lot of money when it opened in 2008, it is now highly profitable. It brought in nearly $17 billion dollars in just the first three months of 2021.
A lawyer for Epic, Catherine Forrest, noted in court that the App Store's profit margin during 2018 and 2019 was 75 to 78 percent. But having a financially successful App Store does not mean Apple has violated any laws. Most legal experts say Epic has an uphill battle to win the trial. I don't think they are likely to win, said Rebecca Ha Allensworth, a law professor at Vanderbilt Law School. However, she said the case may have already served a valuable purpose, drawing attention to some of Apple's practices that many developers see as abusive. Larry Downs with Georgetown University's Center for Business and Public Policy also predicted a court loss for Epic. I would certainly say Apple has the stronger case under existing case law, he said. While Apple may be in a good position to win, regulators around the world are starting to look more closely at the company. As public support for regulating big tech grows in the U.S. and abroad, Epic also launched a public relations campaign to build support for its case. The company has run advertisements accusing Apple of taking a large cut of app sales. Karen Dunn is a lawyer for Apple. She said that rather than investing in creative solutions, Epic chose to spend money on lawyers, PR, and policy advisors in an effort to get all the benefits Apple provides without paying. Joel Mitnick is a former lawyer with the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. He says the biggest threat to Apple's App Store is not court cases, but possible new regulations. If it were me... I would be looking at ways in which I could influence what might be inevitable changes to the rules under which Apple are going to operate, he said. One judge is to make the decision in this non-jury trial. Experts say the decision will come down to a market definition. Epic's position is that the iPhone and the App Store have grown into an influential single market. Apple argues that the market definition should include other devices, such as computers or Microsoft's Xbox and Sony's PlayStation gaming machines. Those companies also charge developers a 30% commission on payments. Downs, the Georgetown University expert, said the judge has to place herself in the shoes of consumers. If it's not harming consumers, then this is just a contract dispute between two companies, with one of them trying to use legal action to renegotiate the terms. He said, I'm Brian Lynn. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. Think of Florida, images of sandy coasts, theme parks, and rocket launches come to mind. But it is also home to a natural wilderness different from any other in the United States. Everglades National Park is the largest subtropical wilderness in the U.S. Several rare and endangered species live in the park. It is a huge place, covering more than 600,000 hectares of wetlands. It is also a popular park. More than one million visitors pass through the official entrances every year. 
but others enter the park on water and go uncounted. In 1947, President Harry Truman spoke at the official opening of Everglades National Park. He said the goal of creating the park was to protect forever a wild area that could never be replaced. The Everglades is considered one of the biological wonders of the world. It is a place where plants and animals from the Caribbean Sea share an ecosystem with native North American species. Nine different environments exist within the Everglades. They include mangrove and cypress swamps, estuaries, and coastal marshes. In the 1940s, reporter and environmentalist Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wrote a book called The Everglades, River of Grass. She described the area as the liquid heart of Florida. Everglades National Park was created to protect an ecosystem from damage. The Everglades is home to about 30 species that federal officials say are threatened or endangered. They include the Florida panther, the American crocodile, and the West Indian manatee. More than 350 bird species and 300 species of fresh and saltwater fish live within the park. The Everglades is also home to 40 species of mammals and 50 reptile species. Visitors to the Everglades will see many exotic plants. They include what is said to be the largest growth of mangrove trees in the Western world. Gumbo limbo trees, known for their peeling red skin. Strangler figs and royal palms are also among the area's plant life. The country's largest living mahogany tree also lives in the Everglades. Sawgrass grows in some areas of the park. Be careful. Sawgrass is very sharp, with teeth just like a saw. It can grow up to four meters tall. With about one and one-half meters of rainfall each year, Plants and trees never stop growing in the Everglades. The dry winter season is the favorite of most visitors when insects like mosquitoes are less of a problem. The rainy season lasts from June to November. There are many ways to explore the Everglades. Visitors can see alligators while hiking the Anhinga Trail. The park is one of the only places in the world where freshwater alligators and saltwater crocodiles live in the same area. Visitors using canoes are likely to observe large groups of wading birds, like the wood stork or the great blue heron. Bright pink flamingos also thrive in the Everglades. Some visitors might enjoy riding bicycles through Shark Valley. Others might want to take it more slowly. The boardwalk walking trail goes right over the slow-moving water. Visitors can take a close look at insects and other wildlife. The park also offers tram rides for guided tours. The National Park Service says that 
early colonial settlers and land developers believed the Everglades had little value. The settlers had plans to remove water from the area. In the 1880s, developers began digging canals to reduce water levels. At the time, they did not understand the complexity of the Everglades ecosystem. As a result, they were not prepared for all the work. They caused environmental problems. Larger efforts to drain the wetlands continued between 1905 and 1910. Farms were built on large pieces of land. More people began to move to the Everglades. More changes came mid-century. The federal government built roads, canals, and water control systems throughout South Florida. The project was aimed at providing water and flood protection for people and farms. Workers built a huge system of waterways and pumping stations to control the overflow of Lake Okeechobee, north of the Everglades. In more recent years, environmental experts learned about the damage to the Everglades. Some experts say the balance of nature in the area has been destroyed. Today, some of South Florida's early wetland areas no longer exist. Populations of wading birds have been reduced by 90%. Whole populations of animals are in danger of disappearing. In 2000, Congress approved a plan to restore and improve the Everglades. Federal, state, and other organizations are partners in the comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. The future is not clear for the wild and beautiful Everglades, but efforts are underway to protect this biological treasure. The hope is that people may continue to visit the extraordinary Everglades National Park long into the future. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Ann Ball. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 